Hi, everyone. This is Chris. I'm here with Dr. Matthias Winkenbach, and welcome to the live event, the second live event for SC0X. Um, you're in your bye week now, week five, so you should be hopefully resting, and you should have just turned in your week four graded assignment, and I believe your midterm starts next week at exactly this time. And remember, for the midterms, as for all exams in these courses, you have one week to complete them, but as soon as you start, you have four hours to complete that one test. So. During the bye week, we thought it'd be good to kind of stop, take a breath, and think about what we've done. And then um, Matthias is going to talk through some examples of cases that he's done. Now, we want this to be interactive, so make sure you use Slido, um, slido.com. Go to that, and the code is SC0X. And I have a poll up there now, and, and this is also a place where you can enter in questions. But the poll I have now is for you to put in one word that describes your experience in SC. 0x so far, and we're making a word cloud out of that, so hopefully you can see how that looks, just so, to make sure you know how to use the tool. You can also enter a question by clicking to the left, there's polls and questions, and you can enter a question in, and we'll start answering those. So I encourage you to enter the questions in fast now. You'll have a higher likelihood of having them answered. A lot of times, you guys wait to the last 10 minutes to enter questions, and we don't have time. So once the questions get entered, we'll throw those over to the open space and you can vote on those. You'll vote on which ones you want to have answered. So use those up or like votes. We don't have any down votes, so, so only positive here. And pick the questions that you want to hear. All right, so you've spent the last four weeks kind of doing a soup to nuts optimization class. You started off with classic optimization and some of you probably hadn't seen calculus for quite a while but that was con unconstrained classical optimization where you find an extreme solution, a min or a max. Um, it seems very theoretical, but you'll use this all the time in SC1X. All inventory theory minimizes the total cost function. Whenever you're minimizing something, you're using optimization. That's why we taught you that. Then you moved into constrained optimization. We started with linear programming, which is like the granddaddy of optimization that you use in practice, and then introduced integer and binary variables for mixed integer linear programs. You'll use these extensively in SC2X and in other courses and in practice. In fact, what Matthias is gonna talk about is a lot of extensions and uses of those techniques. Um, once we finished with mixed integer linear programming, we went into a network optimization which is a key thing, especially for transportation and logistics, where you have a network, whether it's transportation or it's a theoretical network of, say, payments. Um, how do you optimize your, that, that network? And we went through three different algorithms, shortest path, uh, traveling salesman, and then uh, vehicle routing. And we showed how those solutions are used, and we introduced the idea of algorithms, because algorithms are embedded in all the software that you'll use throughout your career. And we finished up the, the four weeks with approximations, which kind of go in the opposite direction. So for these mixed integer linear programs and these large optimizations, you need a ton of data and you get very precise solutions. And then we showed you with approximations how with very, very little data can you make a decision. And so these are two tools that we want you to have in your tool belt. And so the idea of approximations are there so you can start with these and have a good idea of what the problem solution should be and it helps you stay within bounds. Um, so these are all valuable tools, and I guarantee you'll use all the tools that we've taught you in these four weeks throughout the five SCX courses, as well as throughout your career. All right, and with that, I want to introduce Dr. Matthias Winkenbach. He runs our Mega City Logistics Lab. He's been with us for three years. Yep. It seems so much longer. <laughs> um, but what I want him to do is talk about two of the problems that he's faced, two of the projects, and you have to excuse him. He has a slight cold, so he has to speak up. Yeah, so I, take it away, Matthias. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for having me, and I hope you guys, despite my weird voice, can kind of understand <laughs> me. So I was asked to talk a little bit about how we use mixed integer linear programming models in our research. And um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is indeed the distribution network design problem Specifically for urban markets, that's what my lab usually focuses on in its research. But the principles that we're going to talk about here are also applicable to other scopes, not only the urban scope. Um, the work that I want to present here has been done, for example, with La Poste, uh, the French postal operator. We've recently completed a project with B2W Digital, which is one of the large e-commerce platforms in Latin America. And all of the different projects that we do in the realm of network design actually reside on the same kind of principles, the same general 
design of the optimization models that we use to, to solve those problems. So what are we actually trying to answer with the models that we build when it comes to network design? The, the first level of decisions that you want to make is about facilities, right? Where do you locate certain distribution facilities? How many of them do you need? And how many layers of distribution facilities do you want uh, to have? So for instance, you could think of uh, locations to position your warehouses or your the big distribution centers. Um, and candidate locations uh, for those would usually be somewhere in the outskirts of a city. But then, especially if you're talking about large congested urban areas, um, typically we see that it's beneficial to also have a second layer of consolidation, so a second layer of facilities. We usually call them satellites. These are locations where typically only transshipment happens from larger vehicles to smaller vehicles. And from those points, then those smaller vehicles do the final delivery run to the final customer. So the first kind of decision that a, deci uh, a network design problem tries to answer is how many uh, uh, facilities of which type do I need? Where do I optimally locate them? And then the next level of decisions would be which parts of the market, which parts of the city should be served from where. So which facility has which service area? That's how we usually call this. And that service area in the simple case is something that is fixed. So you decide on that once and every day the company operates its route, uh, that facility serves the same service area. You could make it more complicated and say maybe there's different service, uh, service areas per day or per shift. But in the most basic case, you just have one service area um, per facility. And then the next level of decisions is, for instance, a modal choice. So if you have different delivery vehicles that you can choose from, you could have a 10 pallet truck, an 8 pallet truck, an electric vehicle, a van, a bicycle, or even a pedestrian. And these are all basically vehicle options that you want to model. So you want to decide which part of a city, for instance, should be served from which facility using which kind of vehicle. And again, this is something that you would model um, as a part of the decision variables um, of your network design model, of your mixed integer linear programming model that you build to solve these problems. And you could make it arbitrarily complex. For instance, a lot of our project partners are interested in pickup solutions. So for instance, um, uh, pickup from store solutions where customers aren't being delivered to their homes, but they actually go and pick up their uh, order from a nearby store. Um, or you could uh, um, elaborate on the modal choice dimension and let people, for instance, decide or let the model decide which areas of a city to serve directly with your own fleet or by an outsourced uh, service provider like Uber Rush, for instance. And then last but not least, you might also have some flexibility in the set of locations that the model decides on. You might, for instance, have a business like B2W in Brazil, where you have a lot of variability in demand, and where you want to have certain facilities only to be activated during, let's say, the peak periods of your demand. Whereas for the rest of the year, they would be closed down. We piloted that with them, basically integrated the option into a mixed integer linear program uh, to open certain facilities only temporarily to give them that flexibility to cope with peak demand, for instance, around Black Friday and Christmas. But in the very basic case, the decisions that you want to make is um, facilities, where to locate them, how many to locate, and which type of facilities you need, service areas, so which part of the city to serve from where, and then modal choice, which vehicle to choose um, to serve certain parts of the city. Now, the way we typically model this is, surprise, uh, in a mixed integer linear programming form. So if you look at the decision variables that I mentioned earlier, you typically have a number of uh, binary decision variables. So for instance, for every type of facility, be it a warehouse or be it a satellite, you have a set of candidate locations that you could use for such a facility. And the way you model that in a mixed integer linear program is you have a binary variable for each of those candidate locations. And if that binary variable turns one, that means, yes, the model chooses to activate a facility there. If it's zero, it chooses not to use that location. Similarly, if we talk about service areas, we typically tend to discretize a city. So for instance, we cut it into zip codes or um, census tracts or maybe square kilometers. We often use with what we call um, pixels, so these are square kilometers that we use to identify demand on that very high level of spatial resolution. And then basically for our modeling logic, that means we have a bunch of, again, binary variables that decide which pixels or which area of demand to allocate to which facility. And then if you think of 
um, your vehicle choices just to be basically discrete options that the model can choose from, you can again model this as a set of binary variables. And let's say if the binary variable for 10 pallet truck turns one, that means that a specific pixel that is connected to a specific facility is in this case being served with a 10 pallet truck. And basically these are all the sets of decisions that the model has to take. And the optimization objective that we follow is usually a cost objective. So for instance, you have to account for routing costs, for vehicle and equipment costs. You have to account for inventory costs, handling costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously there are also other objective functions that you could use. You could optimize to maximize market reach, to minimize emissions, um, to maximize responsiveness. So basically to limit the time that people have to wait for a delivery. And you could also think of multi-objective optimization. But the most common case is you try to minimize cost. On the constraint side, typically you model. Can I ask a question sure, before you go to constraints? I'll give you a chance to yes, catch your breath a little bit. Um, so I'm actually a little surprised. I, I know this project that you included inventory cost. Um, because for this, usually it's a distribution system and things move in the same day. How are you capturing that? And what is it safety stock or is it just the, the dwell time of the inventory through the system? In most cases, it's just um, the dwell the, time. The, the cycle time. Yes. Through. Okay. Yes. It gets a bit more complicated if you think about um, highly responsive delivery services right. where you need inventory at the satellite locations. Mm -hmm. And you basically have to kind of optimize your inventory positions on a very large set of potential locations. But let's not go down this path yeah. for, for this session. In SC2X, if you guys mm -hmm. take that, we go into some of these models and what we put in there is almost a, uh, a performance guarantee in the constraints where you have to hit at least a X percent within so many days, hours or whatever, or distance based. So it's a way of not getting a cost in the objective function. So you tend, you try to cost it out the inventory yes. for that? Okay. And then one last question, what's the, the rough size of a problem like this? Um, in terms of especially decision variables, because it sounds like there's quite a lot of yes, um, binary variables. So for instance, we've applied this to cities like Sao Paulo, where you, for instance, if you think about those little units of analysis, those pixels that I talked about, we have like 2,000 of those. You have hundreds of candidate locations of facilities. You have maybe five or six different vehicle types. So you end up easily with something between two and three million decision variables. Okay. So that's definitely something that Excel Solver can't do yep. anymore. All right. Um, we talked about constraints a little bit. The most important ones here are obviously you have to respect vehicle capacity constraints and also the capacity constraints of your facilities because each facility, each vehicle is only equipped to handle a certain maximum amount of shipments, for instance. So, yeah, I'm holding up. Do you need me to talk? So, take a Hello. sip of water. Yeah, that's fine. You good? Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to break down this big problem to basically smaller toy problems because at the end of the day, what we're trying to model with this mixed integer linear program is what we call a location routing problem. So a problem that combines location decisions with routing decisions. And you can break that down into two sub problems. The first one is the location allocation problem. So imagine you have a certain area of demand and uh, in this graph here you see, in this chart here you see uh, those three Ds. These are your candidate locations for the facilities. We sometimes call them depots. And you see a bunch of customers, the C's in this uh, map, and basically the location allocation problem basically just lets the model decide which of the depot locations to activate and then which customers to allocate cost optimally, ideally, to which depot. Um, and this by itself can be formulated as a mixed integer linear programming model. The problem about these, uh, these kind of problems is these are NP-hard. So basically, as soon as you extend beyond this little toy problem that you see on this chart, it's, it gets extremely hard to solve, even with modern compute power. It's basically something if you if the problem instance grows, it gets increasingly like the computational time rises exponentially. Um, the second sub problem is the vehicle routing part. So let's assume you have decided which depot to um, open and which customers to allocate to a depot. Now it comes to the question: How do I optimally route a vehicle amongst those uh, those customers? And again, this is a problem you can easily formulate as a mixed integer linear programming model. But again, you have the problem, this is MP hard. Now the problems that we typically deal with in a network design issue is uh, we combine both problems and try to solve them simultaneously. So we decide on the locations, on the allocations, and on the routing simultaneously. So you combine two MP hard problems, it gets even harder. 
<laughs> so basically for real world problem instances, there's no way you could uh, efficiently solve this. And that's where a lot of our research, for instance, comes into place in using approximation techniques to simplify this problem again. Because network design very often is a strategic decision. So you really don't care about the specific solutions of a particular vehicle route. You rather care about how those vehicle routes affect your choices when it comes to where to locate facilities, for instance. So we use a technique called continuum approximation quite a bit um, that basically looks at the properties of demand. So how many customers do we have? How densely populated is the area? Uh, what's the drop size per customer? And we use that to approximate the cost of an optimal route. And that way we can kind of simplify the location routing problem back to a location allocation problem which is still pretty hard to solve, but way easier than the integrated location model. So you guys have seen both of these. You've just never seen these two techniques together, mm -hmm. right? We've done mixed integer linear programming, kept it separate, and then we went to approximation, and we actually did approximations of the traveling salesman problem, which is the same thing. So this cost function that is shown on the screen should look somewhat familiar to you, even though the notation's different. So all that we he did was combine these two techniques together. But let me ask a question. Um, even if we could computationally solve the routing problem exactly, let's say you could do that and solve it exactly, wouldn't you still want to use the approximation? In a way, yes, because at the end of the day, is you, if you design a network strategically, as I said before, you're not looking for a network that is optimal for one particular realization of demand. You're looking for a network that is optimal yeah. on the expected level so basically across all possible realizations of demand you want this network to be designed in a way that you can most optimally serve let's say the average demand scenario and that's why it still has that square root of n times a relationship so mm -hmm. you have to and there's been a lot of research i don't know if you're going to talk about about finding that that kappa or that that so when we had the, that approximation that k value that told you based on the topology what that network um, tsp would be we just gave you a number, but uh, Matthias and a lot of his uh, students are actually studying and trying to understand how to actually find that number in practice and does it change across the city. So everything that we showed you, it's actually being advanced further and applied in practice here. Great. All right, and that's basically, in a nutshell, what I wanted to show about distribution network design. The true models that go into these, like solving a network design problem for, let's say, the scale of an entire megacity for a real-world operation, is huge. That formulation would probably go over multiple pages here. I didn't want to bore you with that, but I hope it gave you an interest introduction to how it's usually being done. Great. All right. So let's. Uh, I put a poll up uh, asking you your experience with linear programming because one thing we're trying to understand is how well you know this. And it seems the most common response is uh, almost two thirds of you. You've learned about it prior, but you never applied it. Uh, that's the, which is the sad thing because that means you never really learn it until you actually apply it. So hopefully you're learning something out of this by seeing how it can be applied. Um, and what I want to do next, we've had some questions, and I'll give uh, Matthias a break, and I'll answer some of the exam questions that he has nothing to do with, okay. right? So the first is, can you tell us, uh, from Christine, wanted to know what will the midterm exam be like? Um, it'll be, well, time-wise, you have four hours to complete it. It'll cover everything in the first four weeks. Um, it'll be comprehensive. Um, but it should be nothing surprise that you haven't seen before. So everything is fair game from the first four weeks of, of the class. Um, let's see, there's some other ones in there. Then I'll ask you some questions particularly. Uh, practice questions from Deb. Practice questions allow three attempts and grade assignments allow two for submitting answers. How many attempts will be allowed in the midterm exams? Attica, correct me if I'm wrong, it's two. You have two responses to get it correct. Um, in the CFX, the comprehensive final exam at the very end, just so you're prepared, we don't tell you if it's right or wrong. So just that that's not for this midterm, but later on, we get progressively harder where we don't give you three attempts or two attempts. We just don't tell you if it's right or wrong. But for this midterm, the one you take next week, you get two attempts. <clears throat> All right. Um, there was one other one on there. Um, Jason asks, will MILP calculation resources be provided for the exams, or do we continue to use online um, Ample, they can use Ample, right? Yeah, so all the tools are there for you. Anything that you use, that's fair game. The only thing you can't use is another person, right? So you can, if it's within your head, 
or within the software, then it's okay. And the key concept document. All right. Um, so here's a question that came in. Where'd it go? Da, 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 da. Um, Vish K asked, uh, said, Walmart is poised to buy 70% of Flipkart. You saw that, right? Yes. I yeah, it's that. pretty interesting. And they're both partners in, in the Mega City Lab. Yes, we know that. Um, and they asked, uh, Vish K is asking it if they collaborated while working on this project slash lab. No. I mean, we work with both of them independently, but typically uh, they are very concerned about not sharing any insights with their direct competitors. And uh, before they got bought, they were still direct competitors. Yeah. So, uh, no, we did not. You didn't bring them together? You didn't broker the deal between No, them? but interestingly, <laughs> some of the people that we worked with at Walmart used to be Flipkart employees before. So there was a, some fluctuation between the two, but not uh, managed by us. There's so much because there were then people who were at Walmart that are now at Amazon, and the Flipkart guys came from Amazon. So it's like just a little triumphant. It's a small world. It's a small world. Um, Renan asks, if the problem is uh, NP hard, do you work the solution until it's optimal or do you just run some approximation? How do you converge? Well, typically we run it till we get to us like a, a satisfactory gap. Um, and with the approximations that we work with on the routing side, um, that usually at least converges to that uh, acceptable gap within a couple of hours. Okay, another question from Vish K that came in earlier. From the last mile data you've seen from around the world, which regions have the most complex or challenging networks? Do you have any examples? Uh, typically the emerging markets. That's why we have a strong emphasis on work in that area. Um, for instance, you have completely different road infrastructures there that might pose additional constraint to your mixed integer linear programming model. For instance, um, in parts of India, but also in parts of Latin America, we literally need to include constraints on which vehicle types can realistically access certain areas. For instance, if you're in Mexico City in one of the favelas there, you really don't want to go there with a 10 pallet truck because it's going to get stuck. Um, similarly, we sometimes have to model risk, for instance, for Flipkart in Sao Paulo, uh, for, for uh, B2W in Sao Paulo, we had to model robbery risk as a uh, basically as part of our model, as part of the constraints, because we needed to minimize the value at risk. They ship a lot of electronics. So if you send a big truck full of elect electronics into a risky area, the expected cost of losing that stuff to robbery is just too high. So it's kind of fun to think about this, but you have to find the necessary data to inform constraints that you then impose on the model. And the model would then actually make the same decisions as you would do as a human, mainly send smaller, uh, seemingly less efficient, but less prone to uh, robbery kind of vehicles to those risky areas. Okay, uh, question from Ksenia. Uh, what software do you use for the routing problems? Um, or actually for the whole optimization? For the whole thing. Um, we don't use any off-the-shelf software. We just use um, Python as the scripting language um, to basically formulate all these models. And then we use Gorobi as kind of the commercial solver engine to solve those large scale problems. You use Gorobi, not Cplex? Uh, yes. Is there a reason? Um, mostly, there's two reasons. One is that Gorobi integrates more uh, seamlessly with Python. OK. Uh, so it has a better API, basically. And secondly, Gorobi tends to perform better uh, when you have machines that have a large number of cores. Uh, so it reduces runtime a little bit. OK. Um, Lisa asks a question, what tools are you using for your data gathering and modeling? Do you use any tools there, or is that? Well, for the gathering, we often rely on data that is provided by the company that we work with. We work with publicly available data, like OpenStreetMaps and, for instance, Google API. Uh, the publicly available data we usually query from within Python um, using APIs that are available to those databases. And then to basically structure the data, to clean it, and to store it, we work mostly in Python. And then sometimes use, for instance, MySQL or PostgreSQL to store the data efficiently. OK. Um, one last question that will serve as a bridge to the next case. Um, Ruhi asks, how do you think new age innovations like drones for last mile deliveries will impact supply chains and decisions? Holy moly. Hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> well, um, I mean, they might have a big impact. Drones, in particular, uh, are being discussed very vividly, uh, especially for urban delivery, which makes actually the least sense. But um, especially Amazon, for instance, with their beautiful little videos, have triggered quite some 
discussion around the use of drones for large-scale deployment of delivery services. Well, uh, we don't really are that optimistic uh, with, the use, with regards to the use of drones in urban settings, but we do kind of think that um, drones might play a role in combination with other vehicle types. So while we currently mostly model single vehicle type operations, so you deliver using only one kind of vehicle, drones might actually be used in a combined way to basically put them on a truck that then moves through the city as a mobile depot and the drones just do the final mile delivery. And that might have some impact on how we need to model these systems and it might also affect uh, the efficiency of those systems overall. So it might have actually big impacts on the network design that you need, so the facility network that you need to support such services. Okay, so do you want to start talking about your second case? <clears throat> yes, that's actually the perfect... Uh, that was my entree. Perfect bridge. All right. So yeah, we already talked about it. Drones uh, are basically discussed a lot lately, and um, so is uh, other forms of autonomous technology. But uh, in this case, we wanted to focus on drones. And as I mentioned before, our working hypothesis for the use of drones in urban delivery is there's not going to be a pure play drone solution. Because if you think about, for instance, all the e-commerce shipments that go into Manhattan every day on the typical UPS, FedEx, DHL, whatever trucks, um, if you would replace all of these volumes by drone deliveries, you would have tens of thousands of drones flying through Manhattan every day, every point of the day. And that is obviously not desirable because it's probably not any better in terms of noise and accidents and whatever as the vehicle traffic that we see right now. But it's also a huge technological challenge because if you have tens of thousands of simultaneous drone operations, you need to find a way of coordinating those movements. So you need to find either ways of those drones talking to each other. Uh, so you need some sort of industry standard, which is not really there yet. Or you need like a centralized air traffic control that's also not likely to happen. So it's just unrealistic to see uh, basically drones delivering individual shipments from somewhere outside of the city into that urban market. But what we do see is in a couple of OEMs, on this slide you actually see a study proposed by Daimler Vans, a couple of OEMs presented studies where they wanted to put drones on top of traditional delivery vehicles. And that could combine the best of both worlds, right? The, the terrestrial vehicles have the benefit of carrying a lot of packages, so you can consolidate a lot of shipments into one vehicle. Um, and um, the drones basically uh, um, make it possible that that terrestrial vehicle no longer has to stop anywhere. If you think about how much time is spent on urban delivery routes, most of that goes into finding parking, for instance. A large contribution to urban congestion is commercial vehicles finding parking or not finding parking. What percentage do you think that is in the city? Do you, I have no idea. Um, I read a study that says about 30 to 40 percent of the kidding. of the congestion that is caused by commercial vehicle traffic is just because they can't find parking. Okay. So it's significant. Yeah. Um, and also in terms of emissions, for instance, commercial vehicle fleets tend to be a major contributor to urban emissions and finding parking creates a lot of unnecessary miles traveled um, and so on and so forth. So the idea is let's combine those two systems. Let's put some drones on the truck and let's route them simultaneously. And uh, with our research, we try to basically build a mathematical model that would be able to form those optimal combined routes. So in a way, with this model that we built, we, were, we want to be able to decide under which circumstances is it optimal to just send drones from a central location to the customers. That's the left case on this slide. When is it optimal to send drones to some customers and trucks to others? And then on the right case, that's the most interesting case. When is it optimal to put drones on a truck and send the truck and basically dispatch the drones from the truck. So that's the one that we're going to focus on here. And this problem can actually be formulated as a mixed integer linear programming model. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single uh, formula here. It's just this won't be on the midterm? No, no. well, I don't know. Um, oh yeah. It won't be, don't worry, relax. I think we just had a huge number of dropouts. <laughs> um, but just to illustrate how this could look like. So in this mixed integer program that you see here, you obviously have an optimization objective function. And in this case, we're actually minimizing for customer wait time, which is a little bit different from the cost objective we had earlier. Then you have a, sh a load of constraints that just make sure that you create feasible routes for both the trucks and the drones and that connect those routes with each other. Because for instance, if a drone leaves the truck, 
it can only do so at a location where the truck actually is. And it sounds trivial, but you have to actually formulate a constraint that ensures that. Similarly, if the drone returns to the truck, the, the rendezvous location has to be a location where the truck is actually waiting. Um, so all this kind of stuff needs to be ensured, and you do that by formulating a large number of constraints that make this model respect, basically, uh, the laws of physics. Um, then you have to make sure that arrival times and departure times of all those vehicles are captured appropriately. Because at the end of the day, what you are looking for in this case is you want to minimize the time individual customers wait for their deliveries. So you need to keep track of when a delivery is being made, when a truck departs from a certain customer, when it arrives at the next customer, when the drone departs from the truck, when it arrives at the customer, when it returns to the truck. All of this needs to be consistent, and that's what we need another set of constraints for. Um, and similarly, you have to make sure that all those uh, routes that you're constructing actually make sense. So for instance, a very simple example is a truck can only depart from a depot once, or a truck that arrives at a customer needs to leave that customer again, or the sequence of customers that are being visited has to make sense. So you cannot um, basically uh, form what we call sub-tours, so where a truck visits customers uh, with deliveries that he never picked up at the depot, for instance. And so you see this is becoming a huge problem with a lot of integer variables, a lot of also non-integer variables. But the sheer complexity of this model leads to the problem that if we deal with problems of more than 10 customer nodes, for instance, it just takes forever to solve. And in this case, instead of using approximation techniques, we use heuristics. So this is basically a general overview of the heuristic framework that we are using for this problem. We start with a very simple, basic initial solution. So we basically take all the customers, and we first of all just route the truck as if they were no drones. And we apply an elliptical customer assignment heuristic, and I'm going to show you in a bit what that means, to allocate some of these customer visits to the drones and make sure that this is like a feasible initial solution that combines both truck and drone deliveries. And then the interesting part begins. So uh, the stuff that shows on our orange on this slide, that's where we use what's called um, basically an adaptive large neighborhood search. So we have a bunch of heuristics, so basically operators that we apply on a given solution. And let's say we, for instance, shift the sequence off to customers and see whether it still makes sense and whether the, cost, the solution might have improved. Or we take a customer that has so far been served by a truck, we take it out of the truck route and we assign it to a drone and we see whether this is still a feasible solution and whether this feasible solution is still better than what we had before. And we do this over and over again. And we have a set of a total of, I think, eight or nine different heuristics. And we just randomly use them. And we keep track of how successful they were. And uh, by keeping track of how successful they were, we, we assign weights to them. So the successful heuristics over time become more likely of being used again. Because apparently, for this particular problem, they seem to have something in them that makes them particularly suitable to improve the solution to that problem. So we go through this huge cycle here until we either hit an iteration limit. So let's say we say we run this whole circle a thousand times and then we stop, or until we know that we are close enough to the presumed optimal solution and then we just close the same thing. To illustrate this a little bit further, on the very left side, you see like this very initial solution where all the customers are being served by a truck. Then one step further to the right, you see what I call the elliptical um, uh, assignment heuristic. We basically fit an elliptical shape to the customers, and we rank the customers by how far they are away from that elliptical shape. And the furthest away customers are those that we assign first to being served by a drone. And basically going through this and making sure every customer assignment is still creating a feasible solution, we get to the third thing that you see on the slide, which is our initial solution for a combined truck and drone delivery. And then we use this set of heuristics that I mentioned before in an adaptive way to further improve that solution uh, that you see in the, in, the, in the third column. And then, I mean, this is, would fill an entire lecture to explain all those heuristics. But that's the general idea how we take a problem that's too complex to solve with mixed integer linear programming in real world instances and use heuristics to solve it instead. Yeah, so um, looking for a couple of questions that were very similar. Um, they're asking about solving NP-hard problems. Yeah, here they are. 
um, both uh, Nelson and Hubert pretty much asked, uh, so there's a limitation in technology to solve MP hard problems. Is there some challenge with that? Um, let me answer and then you can correct me, Matthias. Anytime you have integers, especially binary variables in a large problem, you you rarely solve them to optimality. You solve them to a to a limit. You have an, an integrality gap, and you try to get as close as you can to whatever that boundary is. Um, but in real life, integer programs are rare. I, they don't get solved to optimality. They get solved within a, a certain bound. Yeah, unless it's very small. Problem. Very small toy yes. problem. Yeah. Um, so Ram asked, um, is there a different approach for routing if the customer location is moving, such as cruise ships? Hmm. That would be a very different approach, yes. Yeah, I'm trying to think, because you if you're trying to like um, replenish cruise ships, I would think I'd be planning on the ports yes, rather than replenishing in air. I mean, we have a similar application that we just started working on where you have the idea of having a delivery truck moving and you replenish the re delivery truck with a drone over time. And then the question is, do you know in advance when the truck will be where? Because then it's still a deterministic problem. You still know basically when a drone needs to meet the truck at which specific location. And that could potentially be still modeled as a mixed integer linear programming model. I'm not sure, but I'm confident. Uh, it gets more tricky if you don't know exactly when the truck will be where. So for instance, you have traffic uncertainty. You don't really know the exact trajectory that the truck is going to take and when he's go it's going to be where. And that's going to then become a stochastic problem, and that's going to be very hard to solve with this kind of approach. So there we rather use, for instance, simulation uh, approaches to uh, derive some insights on the performance of these systems. So Farshad asked, um, um, have we ever tried meta heuristics? And what were the results of the pros or cons? Not in this context. Not in, in the uh, earlier problem either, right? No. You don't, yeah. OK. Um, have you used them in practice? Have you used them in any other problems? I, I, I'm not as. Can't recall one, no. OK. Um, so one person asked the question, uh, thanks for the courses. This is Julian. Um, took SC one x how can we get involved in these models, or how can we involve in these models, or include in these models, environmental factors, weather or traffic? Okay, so um, environmental influence factors. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, for instance, we just um, um, completed a project on, on the network design side, where we looked at stochastic network design, so where you are dealing with some sort of uncertainty we looked at uncertainty related to the demand side, so who's ordering what and how much and when. Um, but you could use a similar approach to capture weather. So for instance, you could capture the impact of weather, for instance, on uh, delivery times. Maybe your delivery operations take longer under certain uh, weather conditions. Or you could look at uh, the impact of traffic uncertainty on travel times. And you could use a stochastic optimization approach to capture mm -hmm. the impact of those uncertainties onto your network design. That makes the problems that we're dealing with even larger, because in a deterministic case, you basically only solve these problems for one particular instance, like average, the average scenario, the average state of the world, basically. In a stochastic setting, you try to optimize over a large set of potential scenarios. And that's, again, where you usually, because it gets intraceable for, uh, for real-world problem instances, you use approximation techniques um, to simplify those stochastic models. We use a technique that is called sample average approximation. There's other techniques out there, but uh, yeah, that would probably go beyond the scope of this. Yeah. So the model that we shop showed mm -hmm. before in your first case, that's more strategic. And that will be run maybe annually, right? How about this this model? Is this a daily or a tactical? Um, is this determining which things, is this setting up long-term routes or is it used every day? We are currently rather using it still for strategic decisions because mm -hmm. we want to understand like under which circumstances, which operational setup is the optimal choice. Okay. So if I have a certain neighborhood with certain properties of demand, infrastructure and the like, mm -hmm. should I go there with a traditional delivery model with my van? Should I go there with a truck and drone combined system? Should I only go by drone? This kind of stuff. Um, on an operational level, you obviously need solutions to these problems fast. So you might want to cut some
corners and probably come up with less optimal solutions, but solutions that are just easier to compute. Uh, but there's less uncertainty when you get down to operational, right? You, you sure you'll have traffic, but uh, the demand you assume, if you're you're planning for it, it's happened. Yes. There's no demand uncertainty at that point. Not really, unless we're talking about dynamic routing okay. problems, but um, yeah. But even then, you'd know if the truck was going to be loaded, you know if, it, if it's loaded that it, that demand is going to materialize. Okay. Um, Jason has a question. Uh, neither emerging markets or modern cities are optimized for distribution, unfortunately. Um, how much of a factor would distribution have on the design of a new city, here we go, on Mars? On Mars? Oh, <laughs> I was once at a workshop in China where they actually built new neighborhoods of Shenzhen. Oh, and they okay. asked the same question on Earth, luckily. On Earth. Um, so well, stay with Earth then. We don't need to go to Mars then. So you would, for instance, try to um, optimize uh, just the, 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 the road infrastructure for specific spaces for freight. Typically, the road infrastructure that we operate on, be it in emerging markets or in industrialized markets, has not been designed for the amount of urban freight that we see today. Uh, some of European cities, the road network literally was designed when we were still riding around with horses and carriages. And it's very hard to expand this infrastructure now because of all the built infrastructure, built structure around it. So if we could design something from scratch, we would obviously probably build a completely uh, like a uh, completely grid-based road network like we see it in less old cities like some cities in the US have that grid structure because it's just a very optimal way of um, providing mobility to a, to, to a city and since they were not built that long ago they had the ability to take that into account. But for instance one important thing for freight operations and to make them more efficient is having sufficient parking or like loading and unloading spaces in a city for freight operations, and they need to be optimally located. This is actually an optimization problem in itself, figuring out how many of those spaces you need, because you don't want to have too many, because this is precious downtown space, but you also want to have enough to serve all the retail establishments in an urban area, for instance. And then the question is, where do you locate them optimally? Ideally, you want to minimize the distance to where demand actually happens. Um, and this kind of planning requires us to come into uh, the picture with our modeling again to help, for instance, city planners make better decisions based on urban freight data that they have or that we collect. Okay. Uh, Hubert has a question. Is it feasible to invest in these advanced technologies, drones and whatnot, for last mile delivery in developing countries? Where do you see this, what you've described as more a developing country or a developed country or something in between? Um, so the drone-based systems, at least for delivery to individuals, is probably not going to happen in emerging markets anytime soon because of constraints like safety, for instance. If you were to do this in certain parts of Sao Paulo, for instance, that drone will probably not come back. Um, <laughs> so you want to test this, especially at the early stages of technology in well-developed areas and in relatively safe areas. Um, that doesn't say that the technology won't advance further, so we will eventually see this in other places too, but it's not going to start in the emerging markets, I believe. So Nelson had a question about this as interesting, but in the opposite way, how do you see a drone fleet helping delivery times and costs in areas that are more remote? And you mentioned the Atacam Desert to support mining operations. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure about mining operations. Yeah, because those don't have lightweight things. Yeah, usually yeah. weight is the biggest concern yeah. of drones. Okay. Um, but for instance, um, DHL in Europe um, did most of their drone-based pilots not in an urban setting, but in rural settings. So to, ins for instance, supply medical supplies to some places in the German Alps or in the mountains, or to go and deliver packages to some remote little islands in front of the, uh, in front of the coast. And that's where it's uh, like drone operations are more straightforward to implement because there's less constraints, there's fewer people, fewer competing traffic, uh, fewer things to run into. So it's easier on a technological side uh, to implement this. And um, also you gain more compared to vehicle-based operations because uh, drones can fly on a straight line distance. They are not tied to existing infrastructure. They don't really care about uh, um, changes in altitude that much. Um, so that's where they have their big benefits and where they're also actively used already. For instance, in Africa, we see a couple of already existing operations of emergency relief um, deliveries with drones or maybe the delivery of 
blood supplies or any other supplies for hospitals yeah. that would otherwise be hard to deliver on a road infrastructure there. Okay, so we have a bunch of random questions, and I'll start from the most popular ones. Um, Ashok asked, how is Amazon so successful? Is it better supply chain strategies? So I'll respond, and then you can correct me. Um, they're exceptionally successful and profitable in their web services. And in my opinion, it's subsidizing a lot of their other operations, um, but they're always looking to the cutting edge things. And it's amazing what they've gone into for the uh, the echoes or the, the voice smart home computer, I guess they're calling them now, um, smart speakers. Uh, I, I think they're very aggressive in what they're doing, especially in the United States, taking over some of the transportation legs. Um, and they've been very successful in being very innovative. We have a lot of friends and, and colleagues who work there and work there now, and it's amazing what they can do. But I think their profitability right now is still pretty much buoyed by the uh, web services. Yes. So I don't know, what have you seen? Same, same thing, but one interesting thing is, for instance, you mentioned the smart home yes. initiatives. That might eventually have an impact on their delivery operations, actually, because since, um, if you think about things like same-day delivery, time window delivery, uh, delivery operations, especially in urban settings, get more and more constraints, constrained by the customer, by us. So it gets more and more costly for people like Amazon or UPS or, or whoever to actually deliver to you at the point in time where you want to get that shipment. Now, if you have smart home technology, that might enable at some point unattended in-home delivery. Basically, the Amazon guy being able to enter your home, drop off your package and leave again without you being home. And I think they're already piloting this in some areas. And that takes away some of the constraints. It basically literally removes some of the variables in the mixed integer programs that you have to solve, makes the problem easier, allows them to consolidate shipments better and therefore to become more cost effective. So maybe that is one of the keys for them to become more profitable also on the log logistics side of things. Yeah, but interesting company. Interesting company. Um, so Renato asked, I work in the service industry and would like to know if the courses that we have, uh, if we cover examples about supplying services, professionals, and technologies. Um, so everything that uh, Matthias talked about is actually optimization of a service industry or transportation. And so we talk about it in some degree. Um, and so we'll talk about it more in other courses, SC 2X, 3X, and 4X. We talk about some other applications. Um, but in generally, everything we talk about is logistic services or supply chain, which is a service industry. Um, but as I guess I would need some more examples to know exactly what you mean by this. Um, but we do try to cover this more because one, one of the things that's happened over the last five or 10 years is there's been a servicization of products. It used to be if you had a product with a service, you'd only include the service to be able to sell the product. And now it's just the opposite. And the, the best example of this is recorded music. So you see, uh, we used to buy CDs and albums. Did you buy eight tracks? You're too young for eight tracks. I had cassettes, I had albums, and now people tend to stream. In fact, uh, last year was the first year that streaming revenue outpaced either digital uh, or download or physical copies for recorded music. So people are renting it more. So this whole service side of things. Um, and that's happening in a lot of other industries. Uh, Think about mobility as well, zip cars and things like that. So yes, we talk about it somewhat indirectly, and we probably spend the most time on it in SC4X, um, just in case you were looking for that. All right, uh, Leonardo is asking, do we have access to the model of robbery risk for the problem in Sao Paulo? Is that published yet? Uh, no, we didn't publish that particular part. Uh, but okay. if he has questions, I can point him to some sources of data if he wants to. OK. So we can try and get something with you for that. Um, John Hull is, I'm just going down the popularity one. So if you guys want to hear a question and you see it on there, upvote it and I'll, I'll work it that way. Uh, what's the major difference between a value chain and a supply chain? And how do you optimize agriculture supply chain as it's a perishable product? Um, you want to take the first one? Just between a, a supply chain and a value chain? Uh, to me, it's a word. Uh, that, they mean the same things. I think a consultant you create value along the, the supply chain. chain. So it's so, a different way. I would say the supply chain concept is a little bit more tied to like the physical process versus the value chain rather looks at the business process. But essentially, it's covering the same thing. I'll go with that. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll answer the second one. How do you optimize the agricultural supply chain with a perishable product? Um, neither of the models that uh, Matthias talked about really worry about that because they're kind of like real-time delivery 
Um, but you can include that. There's a whole literature on how to include perishability in inventory. And so it's just a way of thinking of its lifespan. And so you can only have your inventory um, stay in stock for so long. And so we actually did a really interesting project for a candy maker to try to understand as they make, um, if anyone's in the chocolate industry, they make big boxes, of, um, blocks of chocolate that they can keep for months at a certain temperature. And then they have to decide when they want to uh, release that. And it was all about the perishability of the, of the chocolate when you wanted to allocate which one went to which customer. So there's a lot of models, and we'll talk about it a little bit in SC1X when we talk about uh, perishable items. Um, but it's mainly an inventory issue of how much you want to stock and where you want to stock and making sure that you have um, high velocity or speed through your supply chain. All right, so next one. Um, here we go. What are some real-world considerations or constraints that are used in network design when dealing with third-party distribution companies such as XPO? Well, <clears throat> um, basically, when we model these options in our network design optimization models, we first of all have to understand the cost structure behind um, those services. So the cost structure of sending your own truck to deliver is quite different from what you usually uh, pay a service provider to, to do it for you. Um, so that's basically usually the biggest challenge for us to come up with reasonable parameter values for that cost structure. You have certain fixed costs, you have certain variable costs, you have certain costs that depend on the miles traveled, the time spent, the drops made, and all of that has to be informed to be able to accurately depict those cost structures. In terms of constraints, you sometimes have, um, uh, for instance, we are just working on a project where we are having multiple service providers who actually do the transportation um, uh, to the final customer for the company that we're working with. And uh, those different service providers are basically have uh, an exclusive right to serve certain areas of the city. So those uh, exclusivity constraints, you kind of have to model, obviously. Um, but other than that, um, having a third party do it or yourself do it is modeling wise, not that different. No, it's just different costs. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Nelson asks, will these slides be available? Sure. sure. So we'll send these out. Not a problem. Um, uh, so what about the, uh, Daniel asks, what about the actual weight of the package? Is that included in your model as a constraint? Um, not all packages can be delivered by a drone, right? Yes, that's actually an interesting one. So for instance, for the drone, <clears throat> truck drone delivery model, yes, we do have uh, weight as a constraint. Um, so we basically have those, those customer nodes. These are basically each node is one delivery. And if we know that it exceeds a certain weight, we know that we cannot assign this one to a drone. It can only be served by the van. Um, that can be modeled, yes. In the network design part, we also capture weight, uh, because if you think of vehicle capacities, typically the more strict capacity constraint is on the size of packages. But you could also capture the weight of packages, packages and make sure that none of the vehicles gets overloaded, for instance. Um. Viviana asks, have you found some typical patterns of last mile distribution according to the region of, in which the study is being conducted? Do you well, see geographical regional differences? A little bit, but it's mostly uh, tied to the fact that, for instance, in many emerging market cities exhi exhibit higher levels of urban density. Okay. And usually the denser an urban center is, the more likely it is to benefit from a multi-tiered distribution approach, so to have satellites close to the downtown area um, and to really use that concept of transshipment to smaller vehicles or even pedestrian deliveries in those heavily congested dense urban areas. So is it safe to say, Matthias, that it, there's, there's more similarities between cities that of, of the same density regardless of their regions? So it's not like all Europe is similar in Latin America, it's denser cities act the same? Yeah. It's the characteristics. Actually, the characteristics, density is one of the most important ones. Is uh, actually the key definition of how a city would, or how a network would be, be designed for. And when you talk about density, is it density of stores or density of consumers? Well, because it, it's a, it's an evolving <clears throat> field right now, whether you deliver yeah. to a store and they come or you deliver to their home. It depends a little bit on what your business is, right? So if you are um, sending, like if you are Amazon and you send packages to consumers, you care about population density mostly. You probably care about retail density if you think about uh, pick and, uh, click and collect concepts uh, at those stores. 
But for instance, we also work with companies that do not serve the final consumer, but that serve retail outlets. And so for instance, a company like Coca-Cola or whoever, who delivers Coke both in cities in the US and in cities in Latin America, well, they might use a completely different distribution strategy here compared to Latin America, because in Latin America, you have a lot of those small, really tiny, single owner operated retail outlets that we typically call nano stores. You have a lot of them, so there's a lot of retail density, but each individual shipment, each individual store is relatively small. And that calls for a different network architecture than if you just supply an entire truckload to a Whole Foods or a, a Walmart or whatever around the corner here. Okay, we have just time for one and two more questions. Farshad asked a question. Um, 